My name is Dr. Aaron Brennan. I'm an assistant professor at Drexel's College of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry, where I'm uh, fortunate to lead a center um, or direct a center where we um, investigate, um, where we, we continue to investigate, uh, disseminate, um, and practice recovery-oriented cognitive therapy, which is a form of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis uh, that I was uh, fortunate to co-develop with Dr. Aaron Beck uh, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I'm, I appreciate everybody being here today. So with that uh, being said, let's get this party started and think about um, engaging and preparing families. Um, the webinar, this is really about information. So this isn't like a form, considered a formal training and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, not a contract with me or Drexel University. I have no uh, financial benefit from this either. Um, and so I would sort of check out whatever you're going to do, think it through, um, and uh, get more supervision as always. Uh, the purpose of today really is about engaging families into treatment. How do, we, how do we start that process of engaging them in? Really preparing them for the course of treatment. Um, I think that's true of whatever you're gonna do with families. I think particularly if you're going to practice recovery or into cognitive therapy, I think there's a way in which uh, we can prepare families to be better partners in treatment. Um, and then also, how do we capitalize on the knowledge that families have? They're really knowledgeable individuals. They've been in this. They have more data um, inside them than, than any other source that we can get to. So how do we draw on their, on their knowledge base and, and really prepare them to be wonderful partners with us? So families have a large amount of anxiety, right? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're frequently anxious and I don't think that that makes it a fault of theirs. I actually, uh, I frequently think it's a credit to, their, to, to families uh, about their anxiety. If they weren't anxious, many of the people on this, uh, on this call or many of the, you know, of our friends in therapy would go, you know, why are they so dismissive? Why are they so cold? You know, why, aren't, why don't they care? So their anxiety is just the sign that their, their loved one is so important to them and that they want their loved one to be okay, which, you know, listen, I've got two kids, right? I've got a 12 year old and a 14 year old. I definitely have this, you know, I would do anything to make sure that my children are okay. Uh, there's this really sort of bizarre slash, I don't know if it's funny or not, you can tell me at the end, story about before I was even married, Right? I, was, I don't even know if I was engaged at the time. And I was uh, walking through the, the mall with my wife, with my, who's now my wife, and the person who's now my mother-in-law. And we were talking about, you know, um, you know, what I would do to protect my daughter, you know, if anything ever happened to my daughter. Now, let me be clear. My wife wasn't pregnant. My then maybe fiance, maybe just girlfriend at the time, wasn't pregnant. We didn't end up having the, a child for you know, whatever, five, six, seven years from then. And yet the visceral response I had to protect a child that was not even in the baking process um, was so palpable that my mother-in-law got a little uncomfortable about how like emotional I got about protecting my child. And so, you know, we're really, you know, it's, it's just ingrained in us to, to protect our children. Um, now, granted, that actually can be a wonderful ally in helping individuals recover. It can also become, uh, you know, people do some of the worst things when they're trying to protect another person at times. And so, um, you know, that desire to protect will swing both ways to be helpful and unhelpful. Um, many of these families have experienced the episodes, right? The families were there when, the, when, when that first episode occurred frequently. Um, they were the ones going in the hospital. They were the ones sitting there all through the night. They were the ones trying to keep their loved one okay as this, as this thing rolled out of control um, and became this runaway train of psychosis, right? And so, it's important to recognize that, that there's a reason they're anxious, right? This is really terrifying. Um, one of the ways when I first start talking with families is um, th that, I, that I engage them in, um, and I do this, I come at this genuinely, um, is that I start by going, um, I say, listen, there's no chapter at the end of the book, what to expect when you're expecting that says, oh, when your child develops psychosis, when your kid has schizophrenia, and so we're not prepared to do this. And when I've worked with physicians, um, 
I've oftentimes just started off by saying, listen, do you know why you didn't go into psychiatry? Obviously, this is when they're not psychiatrists. And they go, why? I say, because you hated your psychiatry rotation. And the, or I say, you know, why did you become a radiologist? Because you hated your psychiatry ro rotation. And they, they usually, uh, these types of like offbeat comments actually sort of capture them um, and they laugh. And I go, so your job is just to be mom or dad or and understand that families come in, in lots of different ways. Grandma, grandpa, you know, cousin, aunt, uncle, whatever family is in that way. And that's your job. You don't have to be doctor right now. Now, granted, I'm happy to provide you with any information that you want because you have a different knowledge base. This is when people are, when, when the parent is a physician. And I'll do, I'll give them articles, I'll give them things that can be really helpful in helping them learn. Um, and, and so that's, that's part of the process. But recognizing that they really are anxious and feeling quite helpless. And helplessness and parenting are a bad combination. We do not like being helpless as parents. Um, they're oftentimes anxious because they're really thinking through their hopes for the future and really seeing those hopes on a one-way train um, away from them. And so they become more anxious. Um, they oftentimes, you know, as they engage in whether it's an ACT team or a first episode psychosis team or even ultra high risk, um, especially the longer you go into this, into this rodeo, um, Many of these parents and, and families have had the experience of having services and then the service is ending and they're left alone. So whatever happens, families are oftentimes really um, intent on making sure that they are, um, uh, that they know how to do it, right? They always think about the fact that these services could go away at any time and I'm going to be left having to make sure that my kid's okay. And so this fear of being left alone can be really uh, difficult. Um, and, and really, they see themselves as the original provider. Um, and they're not wrong. You know, when, when their loved one came out of the hospital for the first time, it may have been their job to make sure they took the medicine. When their loved one, you know, um, when their case manager stopped seeing them, uh, they had to be the one to maybe hospitalize them or whatever. So oftentimes, they really were the original provider. And they're always going to be the front line during, during, a, not always, but they're frequently the front line during a crisis, right? When things go badly in the apartment, mom and dad are the first ones who are called oftentimes. And so they really, that's their, their worldview as they're going into this process. And so really it comes from this idea of going, this is my child, right? This is my family member. And so you need to recognize that it's mine. Um, and so there's a lot of problems that are going along with it. You know, they're oftentimes thinking about these lost dreams that they had for their loved one. Um, many families, um, and I wish this wasn't the case anymore, um, that many families are uh, still told, you know, maybe when they go into the ER for the first time or they talk with, say, um, somebody at a hospital um, after, you know, during their you know, at the end of their first hospitalization. Um, and they're sat down and told, you know, listen, your child has schizophrenia, right? Your loved one has schizophrenia. Their life is irreparably different. Maybe possibly if they take their medicine, they'll be able to get a menial job um, somewhere doing something. And I know there may be people on this, on this video right now going, People don't really still say this. When I tell you I have talked with loved ones who um, in the last, not in the last month, but probably six, within the last six months, I have heard at least one person told that story. You know, they have a degenerative disease, they're never gonna get better, their life isn't gonna be what it was, um, and you need to adjust your, um, you need to adjust your expectations for their life. And, and that's a hard, you know, and a lot of times people feel like that's an easy pill to swallow. It's a really hard pill to swallow and it's not even that accurate. We don't know that that's true. And so I think having some hope and understanding just like if a loved one um, was in, let's say a loved one was a, a really good at sports um, and they were in a car accident and might've broken something. I don't know that they're gonna get back to playing major league baseball, but there's going to be a lot of work that we're going to do to get there. 
And so really thinking about it that way, but we have no really good data to understand who recovers, who doesn't recover. Um, uh, but what we know is if we don't try, they're never gonna, they're definitely never gonna recover. And so um, this idea of just adjust your expectations and your child is lost is really an unhelpful message. Um, so frequently I start with families by just, you know, um, saying it's just not true. It, what they said wasn't true. And I'm not trying to undercut these people. I think they meant well and they wanted you to be okay, but it's not true. And so let's try to do it. And if we don't go all the way, who cares? But at least we, at least we strike out swinging the bat instead of just, you know, striking out with the bat on our shoulders. So let's give this thing a shot. And then we start talking about it and helping them to make, uh, to understand it a little bit more. Um, and oftentimes families come at this maybe with their own stigma. If I had, you know, if my mom or if my dad had this illness um, and I see my child starting to develop it, um, I might find that, that um, I'm really going to have my own ideas. Um, you know, I frequently, I was even just talking with an individual I serve about um, the, the fact that, um, you know, there aren't like a lot of walks for like, you know, schizophrenia, right? So people don't have a very good image in their mind of what is schizophrenia. There's even a whole movement right now about changing the name because it's a really unhelpful um, label. Um, it has no real predictive validity. And um, it's so heterogeneous, meaning there's so, I mean, I could fill my office here all with people who have schizophrenia and none of them would look the same. I even asked somebody this week um, and I said, well, what do you think a person with schizophrenia looks like? And this person said, well, not me. And so uh, that was some of the problems that we have when we're looking at these models um, of the, these, these illness models. <laughs> So um, the other thing that families come at is they go, this is my child, I know what he or she needs, right? And so oftentimes families really focus in on these simple accomplishable tasks, right? You know, I want my child to shower, I want them to clean up the room, I want them to get up every day, I want them to attend school, you know, these are the things that they want. And so their, I, their expectation of what therapy should look like is going to be different maybe than the way that we're gonna go about therapy um, as, as we move forward. So that leads to this sense of trying to control uh, their loved one. Come on. We're not sure that Bonnie's gonna make it. So that leads us to the, um, the idea that families are oftentimes um, in anxious situations um, control is going to be a natural reaction, right? We want to increase the certainty um, in any situation. And the way that we do that um, is that we, we do it ourselves, right? How many people have heard this phrase, you know, if you want something done right, do it yourself, right? And it really puts us at ease. The idea of like, nobody knows how to care for my child the way that I know how to care for my child. And so if I really just exert a large amount of control over the situation, um, then um, I know what's going to happen. And so the problem with that is oftentimes we're choosing short-term relief and certainty over long-term recovery. So unfortunately, recovery is a marathon, not a foot sprint. And control is a foot sprint approach. We're trying to get things um, uh, resolved really easily. So oftentimes that can start looking like when we're thinking about how families can start, start trying to control, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, teams that I work with and, and practitioners that I work with will oftentimes start talking about the idea of, you know, uh, the families are always questioning everything that I'm doing. They're challenging. They're, they're saying, you know, they're challenging my formulation or they're challenging my, um, uh, diagnosis or the challenging the, the therapy that we're doing. They're questioning all the time. You know, half of my session is dealt with, you know, aunt sitting there questioning what I'm doing. So I don't get to do any of the work that I want to do. Um, other things are, are sort of interfering behaviors, right? Or blocking treatment. And so that might be families that aren't giving uh, medicine or aren't reminding the individual to get up and do some of the interventions that, that we're talking about doing. 
um, even stopping them from going out. You know, so we might set up a, a plan to go and see a friend um, and attend a, a football game um, and families might interfere or block that, right? Or might even block the team from coming to see the individual altogether. Um, now, granted, these are really frustrating. And if anybody says, no, they're not frustrating, I understand. I think you need to, I think we all need to sort of like either A, write a book because you are way more compassionate than I am. I get frustrated. Um, I acknowledge it. Or B, acknowledge the fact that there are things in our lives that frustrate us and that's okay. That doesn't make you a bad person. It's what you do with that frustration. But then also noticing that every one of these behaviors is an attempt to control the situation. If I block the treatment, I'm in control, so I know what's happening. If I question you or challenge what you're doing, I'm in control. I'm the gatekeeper for treatment. And so ultimately, I feel relieved. The big problem that we run into is if I block treatment and my loved one gets worse, I conclude, see, that practitioner didn't know what he was doing. Aaron didn't do it right, right? If I ask a million different questions and we never get to therapy, all of a sudden I go, see, Aaron never gets anything done in the session, but it's because Aaron's spending 30 minutes of a 60 minute session talking to you. And so that's not that I shouldn't talk to you, but it also creates that problem. So one of the things that, that I think we as a system are guilty of and remembering, you know, I always am, am humbled about the fact that like, I'm probably not the first person an individual seeing at this rodeo. And, um, you know, I think I've had like two cases in all of my career where I was like the first professional that they ever saw. Um, and it was like really exciting um, to do. But other than that, most of the time, especially by the time people get to me, they've been to a lot of rodeos. And so everything that another person has done with the individual, I own as I go ahead and start seeing this individual. And so one of the things that we do to, uh, that, that, that our system is really, uh, I feel guilty of doing, um, is this approach of the professionals are here. Step back, the professionals are here, right? Um, we're the professionals, we're going to do this, and you need to understand your place, right? Um, and it's a really devaluing experience. Um, I think, you know, if you think about somebody who's on the front line, really trying to save their loved one, um, and oftentimes the, their approach is a lot like trying, you know, I, I've, I've asked families before, does it feel like you're trying to learn how to fly a plane while the plane's crashing? And they're like, yes, right? And so all of a sudden they've gone through all these things, they've tried the best they can, and then somebody comes in and says, step back, I'm the professional, let me take care of it. And you know, some of us, um, I used to look really young, so that was always a problem, but some of us look really young. So now all of a sudden it looks like a five-year-old's telling you that, you know, listen, your job is over and um, you know, I'm gonna take care of your loved one now. And so it can be really devaluing going like, what do you mean you're gonna take over? I've been sitting with my daughter every night while she's hearing these horrible things every single night. And you're just going to step in because you're the professional. Who do you think you are? And then it creates this us versus them approach. You know, phrases that we've heard, um, you know, I once had to actually pull somebody aside and really give them some pretty strong feedback. And that's not usually my style. Um, but, you know, uh, professionals, I've heard them say, you know, listen, this isn't your therapy. Perhaps you want to think about getting your own therapy. This therapy is for your loved one, not for you. Um, it's between the two of us. And so you can't come in. Now, granted, there, is, there are issues of confidentiality and things like that, but we can still respect the role that the family member has had in it without saying, listen, this is between your loved one and me. This, you don't have a role here. This is between the two of us. Um, Listen, we're helping your child. And there's this real sense of going, well, what do you think I've been doing? Um, and then really saying, I think you need to find your own therapy. Now, I think there's a way that we can encourage families to do that because it's a very jarring experience. And at the same time, starting off with the idea of the professionals are here, you need to find your own therapy. So there are ways in which we can really value the loved one's experience you know, the family member's experience 
um, helping them see, feel um, uh, supported as well. Um, because here's the thing, we either support them and do a good job of transitioning to taking over the therapy for them, um, or we face them as an adversary. It's us versus the family members. Um, and that's not a criticism of family members. They're just trying to keep their loved ones safe. Remember, even before I had my daughter, I would have done anything to keep her safe. And that's the mindset that these, individ that these family members can be in. So um, one of the pieces that we can do is really thanking them, partnering with them in this process, uh, figuring out a way, also really relieving them saying like, you've done all of this, you have really been at the front line for this. You know, um, everything you did, you did to protect your loved one, which doesn't say that they were right. It doesn't say that what they did was, was perfect. It's just acknowledging that, that they did the best that they could. And so saying, you know what, you really, you were there for your loved one and they were so lucky to have you. That's not valid. That's not saying what they did was right. It's just saying that they were lucky. And then saying, what would it be like if you could go back to being, you know, to being brother instead of having to be, you know, a one, you know, a one man act team? Would that feel good? And so listen, I want to partner with you. Um, and I want to take that burden off of you. So that way we can be um, a partnership in helping your loved one recover. How does that sound? Right, so it's really validating what they're doing, what they've tried doing, um, helping them notice that you get the work that they did, and then um, giving them an alternate, allowing them to step back um, at this point. I almost, you know, I just had this image of um, uh, those movies where the person has been in a war, has been in a battle for all of this time, and then it's over, and then the, the new people come in to sort of relieve them and they sort of gently put their hand on their shoulder and go, it's okay, I'll take over, right? Maybe they were on watch or whatever that is. It's that sense of like letting them feel valued for what they did and allowing them to step back from this role of being on the front line. So um, one of the ways that we can really uh, value the families is including them in the planning. Including doesn't always mean that they're the planners, although, I'll be honest, a lot of times I find families have a lot of good ideas. So don't write them out of the planning process either. Um, they have a lot of knowledge. Like I said, there's more data within the families uh, than anyone else. It isn't to say that they know why things are happening, but it is true that they have lots of examples that they can pull on to help you develop a good formulation. Um, so we want to validate the knowledge that they have saying, you know, wow, you really, you really know your loved one. You know, this information is really, is really helpful. Um, and we want to get their buy-in. Like I said, you're either fit spending a half hour a week explaining to, you know, mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, why you're doing what you're doing on top of your hour session with the loved one, or you get their buy-in so they're not always questioning uh, what you're doing. So what we want to do is describe what the course of treatment is, right? That starts by really um, uh, explaining and developing a formulation about why you think what's happening is happening, and then describe what the course of treatment is going to look like. The idea of we're going to start by activating your loved ones so they have a little bit more space back from these experiences. And remember, they have a lot of knowledge. So saying, have you ever noticed that when you guys um, have hamburger night um, and, you know, and, and your loved one comes down and helps to, you know, barbecue the burgers and all that stuff, you know, um, all that stuff doesn't seem to bother them so much. They'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to, we're going to create more of those times where they have space from those and then make it then what we want to do is make it um, natural for them to engage in those types of behaviors. Once that happens, we're going to help them start noticing that a little bit more. So we're going to have to build up a good base of experience together. And so then they're going to be a little bit more motivated and then we're going to figure out where they're going next. How does that sound? Does that seem like that would be helpful if they start learning that when they're doing more that they feel better and they'll go, yes. 
does it seem that your loved one would do better if I told them that or if they experienced it themselves? No, no, no. They got to experience it. I try to tell them stuff all the time and they never listen. But whenever we go do it together, then they're like, oh, I see. And you go, right. That's what we're going to do together. How does that sound to you, right? Getting, you know, do you think that it might work? Can we try it out together? So again, we're getting their buy-in. This isn't manipulation. This isn't lying. This is actually valuing that they have knowledge um, and that they, that they hold a really important role. Um, again, we, we want to get their endorsement and we want to validate their role in this, in this process. And so that really gets us to, to helping us to think about, you know, what does CTR, what does recovery-oriented cognitive therapy look like over the course of treatment? Because if you really think about, you know, many loved ones are saying, listen, she just has to shower, get out of bed, put her dishes in the dishwasher, and attend group. If that's their mindset, if you think about, you know, the different parts of, C of recovery-oriented cognitive therapy, that's going to be a recipe for a crash collision between what I think my loved one needs and what we're going to do. So we're going to think about that process all together. So the first part of it, though, is, is helping them understand, um, develop uh, almost like a, um, like a course of the way the treatment's going to go. Um, I was on a meeting recently where we talked about um, like the, 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 the individual journey right? Or I think in, in pharma, they call it the patient journey, right? So this whole idea that, you know, um, uh, that somebody can see what's going to happen from, hi, my name's Dr. Brennan, uh, and oh, no, just call me Aaron, all the way through, hey, congratulations, you got into grad school. Uh, send me a text message and let me know how it's going. See you later, dude, right? So what's that whole journey going to look like? And so for family members, we want to sort of telegraph the way that we want to sort of give them what they can expect along the way. And also, how are the symptoms likely to respond as we move through these different stages? Um, and so we're going to describe them. And, and I like to think of them as stages just because um, you can move back and forth between stages. Um, they're sort of general, general like uh, mile markers to think about. And it helps families start to understand, oh, no, it's not that they're not getting better. It's that they're in this stage or um, another stage, right? And so that's, that's all going to be fine, right? So stage one, right? So stage one is, and anybody's ever done CTR, if you haven't done CTR, if you keep hearing me say CTR and you go, what is that? Uh, there are a bunch of really good webinars um, uh, that, that I've posted that sort of walk you through all the different steps of it. But stage one, thinking about somebody going from zero, completely deactivated, all the way through recovered, right? So stage one is going to be a lot of that like activation time, right? So it's going to be a lot of these, you know, activation being, you know, showing them cats with lightsabers, right? Going for a walk, listening to music together, having a cup of coffee, right? All of these things, you know, you know, arguing about, um, uh, you know, or arguing about sports, you know, uh, these are going to be the, what we think of in activation. And it's really a time period, the whole stage revolves around uh, reducing symptoms, giving the individual a little bit of distance from the symptoms, setting up that there's some new possibilities. So it's really about, oh, this feels better. Maybe we could do it at, um, you know, during the week or, oh, this felt better. Could you do that with, you know, your sister when you see her? So it's very basic, but this process is going to, this stage is a stage where there's, the symptoms are likely to be really high. Now, whether they're hallucinations or delusions or problems with motivation and problems with connection, um, this is a period of time where we're really trying to drain off a lot of the symptoms for the individual. And then it's sort of like they, we talk about with medicine, you know, there's a period of time that the medicine needs to get into the blood system. Stage one is a little bit of that getting the medicine into the bloodstream, right? So we want them to constantly, and I'm not talking about actual medicine, but essentially if I do activation during session and then I try it out during the week, it's not really scheduled. The individual isn't really self-generating as much, but it's sort of getting you know, if during the week I listen to music four times, that's going to give me even just four times that I'm not immersed in, that I have more energy. 
It's four times that I'm not totally inundated with my voices. So it's setting up new possibilities. So what families want to see is this is a time where we're increasing frequency of activation. Families can be really good allies in this process. But it's not the time where we're going to see them really sharp like when they were in, you know, their AP classes in high school. This isn't the time where we're going to see them going out and doing stuff all on their own. It's not going to be the time where they're going to be putting away all their dishes on their own. That's not this stage. This stage is essentially a reduction in symptoms a little bit and trying out lots of different activities. Stage two is going to be real is, is, you know, once I start seeing it, it's sort of the ice cream lovers um, adage, if a little's good, a lot's got to be better. So now we're going to start saying, well, well, if it feels good, why don't we plan it in, right? I like it, you like it, let's plan it in together. So we're going to be planning in the activity. So the individual should have a, you know, a little bit more access to the cognitive resources um, during this time. Um, if they're planning the activity and action and they're, and they're doing it, they should also be seeing a reduction in some of the hallucinations and delusions, because if I'm busy doing something, I'm not going to have as much time for those things. At that point, you know, between stage one and stage two is when we're going to start eliciting some of those aspirations, right? Um, uh, we want to um, uh, elicit the aspirations from the person at the time. Um, and it's a really good time. Once we have the aspirations, that's going to drive the individual forward even more. Now, granted, during this time, we might see the person a little bit sharper. Um, we might also start introducing not just pleasurable activities, but, but, um, but masterful activities too. We're going to start mixing it up as well. But stage two is the time where we're going to start seeing a little bit more success um, in those times, um, seeing a little bit more of that change that loved ones might want to see and recognize that it's not solid. This isn't sort of like recovered. We haven't really shifted the cognitions at this point, um, but it might be a little bit more predictable. So we're going to see that. Um, and the last stage is really when we get the activity schedule in, we're starting to pursue the aspirations, really starting to shift some of the cognitions as a part of it. A lot of that cognitive restructuring is happening in stage three. So the more the loved ones see these different stages, we have, a short, we have a shorthand to describe where is the loved one at at any given point during the, during the, the, um, the intervention. Um, also, it will explain why you're doing what you're doing during session. Um, so it's important that the, that the loved one really gets a good sense around psychoeducation, right? Um, and so, um, the first part we're going to do is sort of layer out the stages, but then um, it's really thinking about psychoeducation that is more functional, you know, and anybody who knows me knows um, I definitely have a very specific relationship with the concept of psychoeducation. And so um, I find that psychoeducation that's really about symptoms is, is less helpful for individuals. And psychoeducation that is more about the function and how things go together is going to be more useful, right? So um, any psychoeducation that you give loved ones is going to fuel the treatment that you're going to do. So psychoeducation should explain why you're doing the interventions you're doing. So helping people understand these ideas like the conservation of energy, right? The idea of uh, if a person has the belief, I have to wait until I get the energy, um, and they lay around, they have less energy, which reinforces the idea that they don't have enough energy, and so they have to wait around. If I believe that there's no point in trying, it's not going to work out anyway, then I under-engage in the activity, and when I under-engage in the activity, I fail, and that reinforces the idea that I'm unsuccessful, um, which is going to reduce the motivation. And it's a really interesting thing. The defeatist beliefs that why try, it's not going to work out anyway, um, whenever I talk about this in workshops, everybody's heads bob up and down. When I give the example of, have you ever looked at that big, you know, list of notes on your queue in your electronic medical record and go, ugh, why start? I'm never going to get through it anyway. Um, most people, I go, do you ever sit there and start, you know, playing, a, you're doing really great on your candy crush? And people laugh and they go, yeah, yeah, right? Our motivation goes down to engage in it. So it, these aren't, bizarre broken brain things. These are really simple ideas that we can understand pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, the idea about um, functionally that when we isolate, um, we're more likely to hear our voices. And when we hear our voices, that's stressful, which makes us want to isolate more. 
right? So giving them that real functional, I, you know, um, understanding. Same thing about delusions, right? The more I isolate, the more I hear my delusions, the more I think about my delusions, the more I think about them, the more real they feel. I become more anxious. We don't think flexibly when we're anxious. So we're talking about functional psychoeducation versus a delusion is a fixed false belief, right? Which doesn't give family much to do. Same thing, uh, talking about worry, talking about sleep, that worry just allows us to rehearse why the delusion is correct. Um, and that, you know, when we sleep badly, our delusions, our voices all get worse. So helping them understand this functional way um, when we do symptom education, I think it can really leave families feeling quite helpless. I think families say, no, I really want to know what it's called because if I knowledge is, 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 is power, um, you know, it's like they, we, all, we all really believe what they had on NBC. The more you know, bling, 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 right? But in reality, saying, oh, your child has a set of symptoms that are related to these anomalies in their brain, Families go, what do I do? Whereas if you go, hey, you know, when, you're, when we're alone, you know, we're more likely to hear our voices and we're more likely to worry about the delusions. And so they get worse. Not being alone, families can do something about that, right? Worrying, families can do something about that. Those are all, these are all human things that we do. And so if they're human things, then there's human ways to undo them. So what we want to do is in, in the psychoeducation process also is really using their observations, really helping families, um, you know, as we establish these patterns, these functional understanding of the, of the symptoms, the families have seen this, right? That's where I say that they have a huge amount of knowledge. They may not understand why their loved one is doing what they're doing or how, why they acted in the way they acted. Um, but we can draw all of the psychoeducation from their own observations. So um, I always like to, you know, I think using the example of, you know, the loved one goes to grandma's birthday party. This is obviously pre-COVID, but, you know, the loved one goes to grandma's, fam uh, grandma's birthday party um, and the family goes, I don't understand it. It was really weird. Sure, when we go to a party, he's fine. Right? And then he gets home and then he's bad again. And so we start trying to connect those dots. And that's when you hear he, maybe he's faking it. Maybe he's manipulating. Maybe it isn't really as bad as he wants. You know, um, he's, he's, um, uh, you know uh, he's sabotaging, right? All these explanations. Because we're just trying to explain how is my child all day long in, in the room yelling at me about the FBI, goes to grandma's, perfectly fine, very lovely, all of those things, has no paranoia, seems completely normal, and then gets home and right back into it, right? Also in the middle of the night, he's standing over my bed saying, you know, I know that everybody at that party sent all of my secrets to the FBI and now they're using all of my patents. So why did that happen? And, and, Whenever I remember the first time I heard these stories, um, and, and I really was thinking about it functionally, but when I heard the, these individual, these family members describe it to me, I'm like, yeah, it sounds like he's faking it, right? Like, I didn't say that out loud, but in my head when they described it, I'm like, I get it. I get why it's so frustrating, you know? Um, uh, and so all of a sudden they go, um, oh, that makes, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And so what we can do though, is we can help them really understand, right? So remember, when we're connected, when we're talking with people, we're less likely to hear our voices. So the time you're probably the least likely to hear your voices is when you're talking to somebody else, right? Um, when we're talking with somebody, you don't have time to worry, right? You can't talk and, you know, you can't talk and listen at the same time, right? You can only focus on one thing at a time. So all of a sudden we're going down um, and listen, who doesn't love, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people who don't love their grandmother, but like, listen, many of us love our grandma, right? We want to go, we want to see, you know, it's a big party. All of a sudden, you know, we're laughing about that time that, you know, grandma fell asleep in the middle of the, the you know, of the Super Bowl. And then she was upset because she missed the final touchdown. And we're all talking about it. So my brain is somewhere else, right? And so all of a sudden, if my brain is all the way over here um, and thinking about grandma, and then all of a sudden I'm into it, um, 
the symptoms are going to sort of go to the background. So we think about the CTR protocol, essentially it's the hugest dose of activation. And so they just jump in. They don't have time to filter it through the psychotic, through the psychotic lens. Um, and so they're connected. They're, they're not experiencing the symptoms. Um, and then all of a sudden they have a chance to be really successful, right? So let's say they show up and then grandma wants her special drink. And so all of a sudden, you know, I as, you know, her favorite grandchild makes the perfect gin gimlet. And so now all of a sudden I'm really successful. So I don't need my grandiose delusions. Um, everybody asks how I do it. So I'm explaining it to them. So I feel really confident. So I'm not worried about everybody rejecting me because I'm having these experiences as we're doing it. And then all of a sudden it's over, right? I go from like the biggest light, all the stuff in my face. And then all of a sudden I'm in this void again. So we're in the car, we're on our way home. Everybody's tired. I'm sitting in my room, right? All of this fun, all of this activation. I felt so good. And now I feel all alone again. Everybody's gone. Nobody's thinking about me. And as I feel alone, and then that amplifies to rejection, I have time sitting alone in the dark at night, going through things in my mind. And so now I start trying to make sense of every experience. Well, why did grandma ask me for a gin gimlet versus a vodka gimlet? Why did everybody applaud? Why did everybody ask me what it was? Were they trying to steal my secret recipe for gin gimlets? And all of a sudden, I have all of this time to go over and make sense of it um, while in my, in my room. So the symptoms start going up. Um, so it's not that our loved one is manipulating or lying or faking it. Um, we can help the, the, the family see that when they're alone and isolated and worrying, the symptoms go up. When they're engaged and activated, the symptoms go down. And then we just pair with it the strategy going, remember when we said we wanted them to learn through experience? That's what we're going to do. So the next grandma's party we're gonna make sure that we help them draw some simple conclusions at the end of it. So it's important for us to start uh, making sure that the loved ones understand the protocol, right? Because I have been, I have, ex I have um, engaged the protocol and done the protocol um, and all of a sudden, uh, I think families think that therapy looks like this picture. They're like, why is it ice creams, watermelon, and happy, you know, happy face emojis? Like, what are you doing? Don't you know that my son hasn't showered in five, you know, in five weeks? Why are you going out for walks together? Why are you rewarding him for his bad behavior? Um, and it's not the family's dislike or are being unkind to their loved one, uh, but it's, this is some of the ways that they're seeing uh, what we're doing. So it's important that they understand the protocol within the stages, within the psychoeducation that we've developed. So recovery oriented, and this is coming from a guy who developed it, right? So activation is something that I spent a lot of time watching videos and developing as we started to train people to do it. So activation is one of my babies. And I will tell you right now, it looks weird. I did not go to grad school to look up videos of Taylor Swift singing with with uh, goats that scream like humans. I didn't. And yet, that's exactly some of the stuff that we're going to be doing. If you don't know the video that I'm talking about, please make sure you look it up on YouTube. It's definitely worth it. So activation, right? Going for walks, drinking coffee, you know, doing YouTube. It starts looking like, are you just goofing off with them? Why aren't you doing anything real? Um, games, chatting, you know, music, you know, all of those things, right? Those can look like we're just sort of like goofing off. We're not doing anything real. Then we get into the aspirations. I want to be a doctor. I want to get back to school. I want to have a family. If families start going, you got to be realistic. Why are you setting my son up for all of this, you know, pie in the sky things? Um, and then without any, uh, without an understanding, the family start going, um, you don't have your priorities right. I need somebody who's taking my son, my daughter's um, recovery seriously. And so then we start getting some of that blocking behavior. So what we want to do is really help them understand as we're laying out the way that the treatment is going to go and the way that the protocol plays out, saying, listen, it's going to look weird. This is not going to be that therapy where your loved one sits in a room and they ask, you know, um, you know and they challenge their thinking. 
That's not what we're going to be doing in this therapy. But, and you can even ask, how has that worked in the past? Oh, he never wants to go to therapy. Right. So this is what we're going to be doing. We really want to get your loved one in this adaptive mode. So that way uh, he or she um, are, is going to be much more engaged in the process. And then we're going to try to expand the time when they're in that adaptive mode. And through that, we're going to be able to undermine what's leading them more into the patient mode. When we talk to them about all their symptoms and problems, it really elicits that patient mode. So we're going to try to avoid that um, and more accurately um, uh, activate a competing set of beliefs and really making sure that they understand why you're doing what you're doing. And if they go, mm, I'm not sure, say, give me three weeks to try this out and then we can, and let's reevaluate. Um, and really helping them understand that the negative symptoms are what we're going to be focusing in on. The fact that the low motivation, the low connection is, is going to fuel all the distressing voices, persecution, increased stress, reduction in data. L loved ones have to recognize, you know, um, and not have to, but they frequently recognize that when they're alone and they're isolating, they're less likely to, that they're more likely to have these negative symptoms. And so with the low motivation and the low connection, they're gonna see that that's gonna be a problem. And that's some nice psychoeducation to help them understand this is an actual symptom and this is the way that we're going to treat it. So it really is this idea of engaging families in lots of different forms um, and the families can be really active in the activation process. Um, helping them to be much more effective in their behaviors, right? We're really helping them to push out of uh, being seduced by all the problems um, and training them to do all of these activations. If you really want to be effective, let's get your loved one out and doing stuff together, right? Bake some bread. I always tell people activation is going to be better. The stinkier, the better, right? Really invite them into baking. You know, I'll tell you, I've been doing a lot of bread baking since this whole thing started. Um, and, uh, one of the things, uh, whenever the buns or pita or whatever go into the oven, everybody shows up in the kitchen, right? I don't care what they're doing. People could even be on a webinar. All of a sudden they show up with headphones on and they're like, right? That type of stuff. Later on today, my daughter's going to be making, um, uh, bread. I'll be wandering down in the middle of it. Uh, sounds, you know, playing music, listening to music, having a movie on really, you know, pretty loud so they can see it. Even if you're a person who plays video games on your computer, have it so that the sound's up so they might want to see what you're doing, drawing them in. Letting them be the helper, right? Help, having them join in um, and helping um, as a part of the process. All of this activation, now the loved one's going to see, oh, right, when we go for that walk together and look for the foxes in our neighborhood, um, he's not listening to his voices as much. That's, that is true. Um, also doing things in proximity, right? So, um, I might start going out and, um, uh, you know, listening to music or watching a video, watching a YouTube video when I'm right next to my loved one, right? Or if they're on the couch, I might uh, cook in the kitchen. And helping them to develop a uh, perspective right? Making sure that they're holding on to like sort of what stage is your loved one in right now? Where are they at right now in this? Um, making sure that they understand and this is, this actually goes back to the first families thing, that it's a numbers game. Think about the first time that you activated an individual that you, you were serving and how many times it, it, you had to keep trying until you hit on it, right? Share your own experiences with loved ones. Listen, if you sat in my workshop or another CTR workshop and you were like, this is stupid, let the loved one know, right? If you were not, you know, if you were not, you know, um, uh, on the CTR bandwagon from the first session and you're like, what is this stupidity? Share it with them. Share with them the journey that you went through to, you know, if now you're really into it and you feel like this is the only way to do it, share that journey, right? Let them see. And then ultimately knowing, you know, that you weren't always perfect. In, in sort of believing in CTR. That lack of engagement is not a failure. It just means that we have another opportunity uh, to engage our loved ones. Um, try the same ones again, try new ones, really get them in that process. But helping them understand that the more activity that's pleasurable and masterful that the individual is doing, the more likely they are going to be 
um, uh, to, to have distance from the experiences that they're having. And then ultimately distance from the experience and increased access to mental resources is going to play out in the things that the loved one wants. So having them put the dishes away is not unimportant. It's just, let's make sure that we get it done in the step when it's needed. Um, and then uh, making sure that they're not looking for these huge changes, that they understand that it's a process. Um, and that the small, uh, small interest is a huge win for, for us, okay? So um, that brings us to the end of today. I'm going to open it up for questions as, nor as usual. Um, Monday is milestones. Um, I, I'll have some personal sharing about that too. You know, there's a lot of milestones. It is the season and I think it can have a, a real impact on the individuals that we serve. You know, if you just got a job or if you're graduating and things like that. So we're going to talk about how do we help individuals process milestones, um, savor the milestones in the ways that we can have them. Um, and with that, um, got to figure out how to sh stop sharing. Well, I'll never stop sharing guys. Um, so questions people have. Oh, hey, Aaron. hey, hey, Sunny. I was wondering, have you ever, um, put some of, uh, the information you discussed with, uh, adaptive mode and patient mode, um, and also, um, your suggestions for families into patient handouts or family handouts? I want to, it's definitely on, on top of my list of things to do. Um, I just unfortunately have a very long list of things uh, on top of it. I think uh, there's, a, there's a manual that I've been working on uh, that, that is essentially all of this um, and that would have handouts as well. But if you make a handout, please share. Okay, will do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a really great idea. I think a lot of times, and I think a handout, uh, the thing I like about handouts is if we, when we construct it up on a board together, and then I go, oh, hey, and you know, this might be helpful as well, right? So I would say construct this all on a dry erase board or on a share board if you have to do it digitally, um, and then have the handout as a supplement right. versus saying, yeah. here's a handout, you know, um, because I think we can, it can go together like that. Uh, do I have some video recommendations? Um, I do. So some of the videos that I think are really, what are some good video recommendations? Um, I think the TED Talk, well, it depends on what we're, what we're aiming at. So I think um, I'm always a big fan of uh, Eleanor Longden's TED Talk. Um, you know, uh, I think she just really captures it really well. Um, uh, I think uh, there's some great... Um, uh, you know, um, I think there's some great, uh, I, I think Ellen Sachs is really a great one. Um, I think I usually prepare people for Ellen Sachs. I think her TED talk is really powerful, um, but I think it can get people really freaked out um, sometimes just because of the severity of her experience. I mean, although Eleanor Longden's experience was really quite severe. Um, so I think those are some good videos. Um, Jim Van Oss has a really great one, but it's, it's more about him talking about what is schizophrenia. So those are just a couple ideas. So other questions? Um, and actually just one add, thing to add to Carol's uh, question. Oh, hey, how's it going, Brittany? It's good to see you. Um, is, uh, and this might be a little controversial, but um, I really inoculate people against, families against um, a lot of the messaging out there by people like E. Tori Fuller, who basically says, you know, uh, a lot of his messaging is around, you know, his book is called Surviving Schizophrenia. So I think that's like uh, it enough. And I said, listen, I don't agree with those people. That's my worldview. My worldview is that people recover. And so I might be stubborn, I may be stupid, but if you're working with me, that's what you're gonna have. So I'm sorry, or you're welcome, depending on which one that is, is more appropriate. So Brittany, you had a question? Yeah, I was um, really the conversation about like taking back control and stuff. Those have been some of my most challenging um, cases with family. And I was wondering like, so for me, I'm a prescriber. I think being a prescriber, sometimes that builds this like power dynamic, but like other things like maybe if the family's advocating to have them hospitalized and they're not, you know, it's just like, no. Or, or another one that's coming up for me is, is like a person petitioning to reverse guardianship. And it puts you in this position where it's like, you're the gatekeeper. And then I, I think like that's a family then is like, well, then I'll remove him from care. I'll, you know, take all these, this time in session. And I was just wondering if that changes anything with how you approach it 
if you're in this. Um, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a prescriber, so I, I'll be honest. I I shamelessly uh, kicked that can <laughs> kicked that can down the road. So uh, I I've met me. Um, although it's interesting, so Sunny is one of my old residents, and now somebody who I I, I love collaborating with. Um, and so uh, I think I think just upping the amount of collaboration. Um, and I done a little um, research on you, so I know that you're actually highly collaborative. Um, I reached out to, to my friends. Um, and so uh, I think the more collaborative, uh, the more uh, we up the, um, the shared decision making, uh, the more we just equal it out. One, I actually think it's accurate. So the reality is, is whether you say, I don't know that we need to do guardianship or whether we need to hospitalize a person or not, if they, might, if they don't like what you say, they're like, great, absolutely, thanks. And they leave and they go get the person hospitalized anyway, right? They go, they do, or they, you know, they, you know, they do it themselves. So there's that. Um, same thing for medicine, same thing for all that stuff. And so I think just, you know, and, and I think this is true for non-prescribers too, is going, you know, let's come up with a decision together, looking at the pros and cons, saying let's have, and I know we don't always have time for as detailed of a conversation like this, but setting it up from the beginning and then saying, listen, if we come up with a plan, if we all go in separate ways, we're never going to know what worked. So let's figure this out. And so I think sharing a lot of formulation, um, uh, you know, sharing a lot of formulation with people, sharing a lot of um, the decision making, laying it out in front of us. I mean, I, if anybody's ever done motivational interviewing, um, they really have that sort of menu of options approach, and then we can just look at it all. So you get, that gets you out of the yes, but problems that we get into. You go, you know, we could probably do this, and they're going to feel empowered. Yes, but, and then you go, Ugh, right, like it's frustrating. And so I think just it, the more equalizing we are, um, the it ultimately we get out of as much of a power struggle thing. And when somebody's like, yes, but you're the gatekeeper, we can go, yeah, can I just share with you my approach? And this is where I'm coming from. And then I list out, they go, yes, I give them, here's my formulation. Here's the strategy that I see. Here's what I think happens based off this formulation if we hospitalize them, right? And what are we really gonna accomplish in the hospital? We're gonna feel better in the short run, right? Hospitalization's great. My loved one is in a safe place, theoretically. But where are they going to be when they come out of the hospital? Their medicines are going to be dramatically changed. Um, they're going to be mistrustful that we're going to hospitalize them again. And, um, uh, and we're going to be exactly where we are. So what are we trying to accomplish? And I'm not being challenging. I'm just saying, I want to understand this. And then, and then I'll say, but let's meet all those needs that you wanted. So you want to make sure that your loved one's safe. You want to make sure that they're taking their, that, that their symptoms are done. Here's the plan that's going to meet that and have us three steps ahead at the end of the weekend. So figuring it out that way. Um, so, but I've heard a dirty rumor that you're very collaborative like that. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, well, I try to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Is that, is that helpful, Brittany? Very helpful. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions? I love seeing all the people on here who I who I uh, who I know. So excellent. Well, everybody have a fantastic weekend um, up here in Philadelphia. It's going to be like eighty-five degrees, which is like bizarre. Um, but uh, everybody be well, be safe, have a wonderful weekend. Please take some time for yourselves. Uh, I'm going to try to get this one up as fast as possible. I was a good boy with the, with the exposure therapy one. I got that thing up like that night. I, I was really proud. Uh, but be well, be safe. Please be compassionate with yourselves. This is a really hard time um, as it stretches out. So take it easy and see you guys on Monday for Milestones.